Um, good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy um, Forum. My name is Miss Khalif and I'm a sophomore at the college studying neuroscience. I'm also a proud member of the JFK Junior Committee Forum. Um, and so just a quick few um, housekeeping notes before we start. So please note the exit doors which are located on the JFK Street side of the forum. So that's on the left and the other one on the right. So in case of emergency, please lo locate those in advance. Um, in addition to that, please also take a moment now to silence your phones. Um, and yeah, please take your seats now and join me in welcoming, welcoming my fellow student, Sarah Solomon, who will introduce our guests. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Sarah Solomon, and I'm a junior at the college studying government and serve as a member of the Forum Committee. In the aftermath of the 2020 election, amidst the turmoil of the COVID pandemic, the U.S. witnessed a rise in claims of election fraud and interference, despite the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency's release statement assuring this election to have been the most secure in American history. This discussion continues into the upcoming midterm elections, especially surrounding the use of social media as a mobilizing tool to disseminate election mis- and disinformation. This evening, we are privileged to be joined by Chris Krebs, the former head of the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency during the 2020 election, who has had an esteemed career of service in the Department of Homeland Security as the Undersecretary for the National Protection and Programs Directorate and the Assistant Secretary for Infrastructure Protection. Following his government tenure, Mr. Krebs has founded a cybersecurity consultancy, the Krebs Stamos Group, where he currently serves as partner. We are also honored to be joined by our moderator, Dr. Joan Donovan, who serves as the research director for the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. In this role, Dr. Donovan largely specializes on the consequences of technology for civil society and democracy, including her trailblazing work on online extremism, disinformation, and social media. Before I turn it over to Dr. Donovan, we have one programming note for next week. We hope you will join us back at the JFK Junior Forum for the Seymour E. and Ruth B. Harris Lecture given by former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick a graduate of the college and the law school who will share his perspectives gained through a distinguished career in public and private life. Thank you all very much for joining us tonight and we hope you enjoy this evening's discussion. Thank you so much for the warm introduction. It is really great to be here at IOP again and very thankful to the Shorenstein Center and the Belfer Center for co-sponsoring. I do want to warn you that I have, uh, I'm just going to fix this little thing, keeps sliding off, but uh, I've stalked the crowd, uh, unfortunately, in my favor. And uh, many of these are my students in uh, media manipulation, disinformation, as well as my fellows and colleagues in the, at the Shorenstein Center. And so good luck. <laughs> uh, you're going to have to, you know, you're really going to have to bring your A game here. Okay. I didn't know if you knew the forum was an adversarial debate event. <laughs> um, I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, but super hacker man. What's the credentials here? If I say up, up, down, down, left, right, left, <laughs> right, can you finish the phrase? Uh, B, A, B, start. Yes, okay, so you've passed. And, uh, well, the game though, what game? That's Contra, right? Yes. And that's uh, sort of an early, How many lives? early cheat code. 30 lives, come yeah. on, <laughs> come on, right? But um, I open with a, a little bit of a joke about you know, the way in which we encounter technology in our lived experience, something as a secret, something as a, a playful thing, something as a treasure, sometimes something as a, uh, an organizing tool, uh, a, a workplace. I mean, come on, how much of our time is spent on spreadsheets and other forms of documentation on these computers. But they also bring a lot of levity. A technology can bring a lot of uh, uh, coordination, cooperation, it can bring a lot of people together. 
in some very positive and pro-social ways, and then in some of the ways that your career has really uh, grown up around, which is in very dangerous and nefarious and, and sneaky ways. Um, but I would love to open up by asking you a bit about, uh, you know, with a little bit of a shine on the, your past careers at Microsoft and uh, the first version of CISA, what has technology meant to you as you've navigated different professional roles? So the way, <laughs> it's a broad question. Um, I, look, I think whether it's in the, the jobs I've uh, been able to do or, or just the way that we experience um, everyday life, I mean, look, the point of technology is to make things easier. It's to make things more efficient. It's to give us better telemetry and understanding and derive better insights. Um, the problem, though, is that the, the balance of benefit and the downside, um, it, there are downsides. And that allows bad actors who want to monetize the technology pieces gives them plenty of opportunity. That's, that's, that is like the best case study for that right now is ransomware. Mm -hmm. Right, there are vulnerabilities that bad guys have figured out how to monetize and there are no meaningful consequences on them. So why don't we address the vulnerabilities? And this is really where I've spent a lot of time is on the policy side, but why don't we address the vulnerabilities then? Well, the problem is that uh, Daniel Meisler talks about this with kind of the gain loss or the win loss ledger of software and, and, and technology products. Like, the benefits of technology still far outweigh the downsides, even with hacking, even with disinformation. The benefits we derive are still so far out in front. You know, effectively, security is, a, or, or technology is in software, it's as secure as it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And so for now, we're kind of left with this broad attack surface uh, that that is continuing to lead to societal harms, not just on the security side, but on the erosion of trust and confidence in democratic institutions. Good answer. <laughs> I'm just being fun. <laughs> We're just having fun. But let's talk a little bit about the, the way the internet has developed um, over the last uh, at least 20 odd years as, as we've started to enter this moment of more than just content delivery, but connecting people to people. And you had talked about a bit, a bit about attack sur surfaces. And in our course, we also talk a lot about the internet being a tool, a tactic, and a territory. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the precepts of our lab is always that uh, everything open will be exploited. So if you think about the structure of the internet infrastructure, the communication infrastructure in particular, where do you even start think, like securitizing something like that? There, I mean, do you start at the devices? Do you start at the components, you know? Well, there, so I, this is, Again, I keep using ransomware as an example because I think it's something that most people can relate to given what happened this summer and mm -hmm. with Colonial Pipeline. Um, th there, is, there are no... So do you want to explain Colonial Pipeline just in case? Yeah. So this, or what was it, late May, early June, uh, a ransomware actor locked up the, um, the IT systems, the business networks of Colonial Pipeline, which feeds from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up to New York Harbor, and it serves av aviation gas and refined fuel products for cars, gasoline, uh, throughout the eastern seaboard, and to the point where it's, I think it's one of the largest pipelines, if not the largest, in, for th those refined products in the United States. Uh, locked them up, they were offline for you know, several days, which created not just, and here's, here's I'm about to get to the punchline. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just about the direct effect of an attack. It's not just that the things were kicked offline and there was uh, a disruption to the, f to the flow of fuel. There was the attendant psychosocial impacts of the attack, mm -hmm. where not just was fuel stopped, but there was fear amongst the population in the affected area that there was going to be a longer term outage. So then that created a run on mm -hmm. available stocks. 
which you can take gas out of the ground faster than you can put it back in. And we see this every year in, in hurricane season as well. So that is why, and there's a, that piece of psychology, that perception hack, mm -hmm. is what we really had to optimize for in the preparation of the 2020 election. Yeah. It wasn't just about protecting the election systems technically. Mm -hmm. It was also realizing that there would be people out there that would use the narrative that a system was hacked mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to try to drive fear and undermine confidence that we also had to account for. And, and that's what led to some of the initiatives that we developed. And that might have a lot to do even with the way people made assumptions about what really happened in the 2016 elections. And you had all of this fear mongering around the influence of Russia and the attack surface that was social media at the time. And it does strike me that there are some uh, similarities between these examples that you're bringing together um, because it's, it's <laughs> always with the wires, there's nothing I can do. But the, uh, you know, the way in which um, the internet is designed there's always a lot of digital shenanigans, right? And so that notion of perception hacking, which I've heard you talk about a bit before, sometimes we may over explain uh, something as a very uh, impactful yes. technology, yes. as if uh, online advertising is as, as uh, useful and as amazing as it would have us believe. Is that part of the perception hacking like ver vi like uh, uh, tactic and their strategy that we should also be worried about? I, I think so. I think technologies, um, certain technologies are too complicated in the networks and the systems of, and then the systems of systems are too complicated for the human brain to actually comprehend and make decisions and trade off decisions based off of. So one of the things about, again, about elections is that it's not really clear, frankly, how technologies are used to help conduct elections. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they make elections more accurate mm -hmm. and they make them more efficient. So when you think about counting, uh, the humans, when single humans counting ballots, for instance, have an error rate somewhere on the order of anywhere from like 10 to 20%. Machine wow. counting, assuming no, Mm -hmm. adversarial malicious interference it's like below zero mm -hmm. not below zero it's, yeah you know what below I mean. zero uh, spreading misinformation <laughs> one one harvard university at a time um, we're all yes. but no i i hear you is that uh machines uh machines uh, create a lower error rate and humans are fallible, and I would say there's no such discipline more aware of this than sociology where I come from because counting things is hard, yep. right? And that's something to be uh, thinking about. And if as humans are really bad yeah. at repeated tasks yeah. uh, over and over and over with consistency. With consistency. Well, we get bored. We start thinking about other things, you know, like vacations. Mm-hmm other places to be, what we're gonna have for dinner, right? Like that repetition is, is something that machines do a lot better with, right? right? Because they're not wondering what their friends are doing, you know? Or posting on Facebook. Or like, yeah, figuring out how they're gonna check their Instagram and right. not get caught, right? right? Um, let me ask you then about the critical infrastructure question, because you brought up Colonial Pipeline and, um, what I love about being at the Harvard Kennedy School is we love to discuss really boring things, right? <laughs> we love it. And things that, like infrastructure are, it seems, <laughs> my class is laughing because they know how much I just love infrastructure. And when we talk about communication infrastructure, you know, I'm a big fan of saying that on one hand, I think Andrew Breitbart, Breitbart was right, that politics are downstream from culture, but culture is downstream from our communication infrastructure. And for a long time though, when we thought about critical infrastructure, we're thinking maybe power grids and, and telephone, uh, maybe we're thinking of tubes and wires that bring us the mm. internet, but we're not necessarily thinking about the products online as critical infrastructure. And how has what's been happening with social media 
uh, particularly around perception hacking about what it means to vote in an election, changed or augmented or should it augment our thinking about what should count as critical infrastructure? So that was an arc of a question that I kind of want to go back to the beginning on mm -hmm. um, that I will ultimately answer your question. But so, I'll, I'll be here. so there are critical infrastructures that uh, so the U.S. has, you know, it depends on the year or the month, but it's anywhere from 16 to 17 to 18 different critical infrastructure sectors. And in the U.S., we tend to over count or categorize. You know, our European counterparts only think six or seven sectors are truly critical. We tend to think that anything that plugs into the economy supports national security or economic security is therefore critical. Uh, we're getting better at really defining what the functions are rather than just the organizations like this bank or that bank, but instead it's like, it might not be the ATM network of the bank, but instead it's the wholesale payment system. And so really trying to figure out those things that are systemically important. And that's, that's where we have to go to really truly understand risk. But there are things like power generation, transmission, and distribution that in any significant weather event, hurricanes or otherwise, are top of the list. They're also very tightly linked with communications infrastructure. So a lot of these things kind of run in the same pathways or use the same easements. Uh, and so when you talk about restoration, those things from a physical perspective have to be restored in very tight synchronization. Water is, a, is another one. Now, the interesting thing, so I'm going to use Hurricane Maria as an example here, but when Hurricane Maria came through and wiped out the power grid, wiped out the port, or at least shut down the port, one of the things that we really focused on restoring as quickly as possible was the communications infrastructure because of the psychosocial impacts, mm -hmm. right? So that you could make sure that the people that were stranded on that island experiencing the challenges that they were could at least phone a relative, phone a friend, mm -hmm. um, but be in touch and say, look, I'm okay, how are things up there? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we don't have power yet, but at least I have a reconnection. And even though we're on an island, mm -hmm. you know, at least we have some better connection back to, mm -hmm. uh, back to the mainland or elsewhere. And so we actually worked with AT&T, a few of the other um, uh, telecommunications providers to actually get sell on light trucks and sell on wheels um, so it just looks like a, a big uh, truck with a big, you know, rate, uh, uh, dish on the back, yeah. tower on the back. And we put them on a C-5, mm -hmm. uh, airlifted them out of Dobbins Air Force Base in Atlanta and got them down there. Um, and that was just one example of, you know, you, you, when you think about critical infrastructure, think about the things that connect people. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then you, you at the same time have to worry about power, but power takes a little bit longer. So the definition of critical infrastructure is evolving over time. I think the technologies that we use, yes, there is an IT sector, there is a communication sector. I think the, the fiber, the, you know, the tubes, as you said, <laughs> connects us all. That stuff mm -hmm. is absolutely critical infrastructure. But we also have to think about the systems and services and, that are effectively now utilities like cloud infrastructure. Mm -hmm. you know, we have to start thinking about those things as utilities because of the aggregated risk that they present in the data centers and that, that, that mesh of regions uh, presents to the way that businesses, governments, and others uh, conduct operations. So let me just dial in a little bit then, because when Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram went down, people were calling the police saying, like, Facebook's down, right? So, there, so this is so a, but, but is okay. That, is, that a, is that because they view it as critical infrastructure? But, you know, like, where, where do we go with something like that? Where so how many people here so use essential? a, like, Facebook or something like that as an authentication tool, right? To get into other like, websites? So if you want to log into, you know, whatever, you know, the Boston Herald or the Washington Post or New York Times, you can use Facebook as an authentication mechanism. Like mm -hmm. that, okay, and then you, you talk about. Now the passion's coming it's, in. Oh, you like go, oh yeah, just, come on. Triggered me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so Instagram, it's a massive, massive uh, commerce tool. That's where a lot of small businesses market and mm -hmm. how they conduct daily business operations. Like mm -hmm. it was a significant outage mm -hmm. for a lot of infrastructure. And that's what we, we don't always see those connective mm -hmm. tissues that, you know, we just think about, you know, goofy dog pics and, and, and yeah. you know, beach pictures. But there's a lot that rides behind that. And I think that's where 
we need to have a national policy conversation on what those things are, where we're seeing concentrated risk mm -hmm. that perhaps we haven't built in the necessary resilience. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it wouldn't take much. It, it, and we don't even have to be thinking about, you know, determine foreign malicious adversaries. I mean, the, the, the number one culprit of, of uh, power outages domestically is there's, it's squirrels. No, don't blame lines. them. Don't blame them. Don't bring They're, them into this. The, the amount of economic loss caused by squirrels on an annual basis would shock you. <laughs> sure, my, my local telephone company it would be happy not, to hear it. It is not below zero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's double down on, on resilience for a little bit because one of the funny things about, um, you know, you have a very uh, high tech sounding, you know, uh, job when you were at CISA and what, your director, director. But, you know, like you say security twice, cyber security, infrastructure, security a uh, agency. That's we a like deal. security so much. It's in our name twice. But, you know, zero. it's it sounds a a little, one, it sounds it's... a little technical. But I only say <laughs> that to bring up the fact that. You know, when we talk about resiliency and one of the jobs of CISA has, has been has, under you, especially was to secure this election, but you're not out here asking people to vote on their phone, right? You're a big fan of paper ballots. And is oh, there- a, Is Bruce here? Like, no, like, no, Bruce. Come on, we need Bruce trigger warnings Bruce had to walk out like a while ago. Um, he was probably very, very <laughs> triggered by some of this stuff. So, you know, but th that's that's something where I, y you would think that you would, in an ideal system, technological system, you would be able to secure it in such a way that people could be counted having one vote. You would think that the system was that tight and like security ready. But I don't think we're ready for something like that, even though we're out here using our names and our credit cards and throwing our money around the internet. But it doesn't seem to matter as much, but there's something sacred about but voting. Why? What's, so, so like tease that out, right? Like what's the difference between your bank account and your vote, right? There's immutability with mm -hmm. your bank account. The yeah, bank I can knows call up the who bank you are and, and how much money you have and what transactions you're conducting. Yeah, and if, I, if fraud happens though, I've got a... Uh, uh oh. I'm All right, I'll it. talk. Yeah, so, so that's the difference, right? So with banks, you, you have that connection between identity and the, the thing that's associated with it. With, with voting, the, the, as long as the secret, a secret ballot, the secret ballot is the law of the land in all 50 states, you have to have the, the privacy separation here. And you just can't achieve that. The technologies aren't there. Uh, right, and if somebody says the blockchain, I swear. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's not there. So in, this, in the meantime, you know, we don't always need to be racing headlong into the next technological innovation because it makes things easier or, or more accessible. We, it, it's okay to dial it back and keep it simple. All right. So with, with voting, we want, and this is, so this is one of the biggest differences, I think, between 2016 and 2018 was we went from below, not zero, below 80% mm -hmm. of votes cast in the US had a paper ballot associated with it, an auditable record. Mm. For the 2020 election, it was 95%. Okay. So we were, we were able to work with states to either retire systems, they got funding from Congress and they retired systems that were touchscreen with the vote saved down on removable media. Mm -hmm. And there was no paper record associated with the individual votes. And given that, there's no way to meaningfully audit the vote count. Mm -hmm. um, so whether it was from COVID in states like New Jersey that switched over to mail-in voting entirely from those old systems, or states like Pennsylvania and Georgia that went away from those old systems to voting systems that, use, uh, that, that mark up a, a ballot, that gave us a lot of confidence in the ability to go back and count the votes. So when the claims were in the 2020 election that the Kraken or hammer and scorecard or whatever the claim- Communist were, algorithms. It was, it was dead Venezuelan dictators that were a, adjusting the vote counts. Mm -hmm. We were like, okay, well, how about we count it? So Georgia counted it. They yeah. counted their vote three times 
and it was consistent every, every single, single time. time. And that's, again, paper gives you the ability to audit. So where do we need to go from here? We need as close to 100% paper as possible, and then we need meaningful post-election pre-certification audits in all 50 states. And, and we're about, I think it's about 32 or some odd. Now, not, mm -hmm. not post-election audits that happen you know, six months after the fact, you mean um, by my shadow cyber ninja security agency? So there are standards for, elect, for audits, for election no. audits. There are best practices. No. For people that do this. You can't just uh, throw them all out on the floor and say, take a picture of this, put it on social media, say the whole thing's been rigged. You can't that, just do that? That is not a best practice. It is in my book. No. If I was running elections. But I'll again, the, the point was, the, the point was resilience, right? Yeah. That we could take a hit, and as long as we had the fallback on an analog mm -hmm. solution, that we had confidence. So if Georgia and Pennsylvania had not made that switch to those other, to, to the, the new devices, I would not have been as confident yeah. in, in 2020. Well, let's talk about taking the hit, because you, uh, CISA was a little known agency. We had, <laughs> that we had people had been talking what? about it here and there in the lead up to the election. Uh, I had been on some conference calls with other researchers, people from CISA. You were taking it pretty seriously. You had created a, a website uh, called Rumor Control. You were gonna, you know, put little stubs up saying this is something that's been dispelled. And then like you come out of the box a few day, a few weeks after the election and you don't tell us that this whole thing's been rigged. In fact, you say the opposite, right? And you really took the fall um, for democracy in my mind, or at least the integrity of that election. What was that like for you? I mean, it is in some regard easier to be quiet Right, but what did you feel like? Was there a duty you felt so, for your team and all the work you had put in? Uh, did you feel like getting so, fired? So you, no. <laughs> yes, that was in my bucket list, getting yeah. fired by tweet. Well, you, um, Amorosa, I mean, I thought I was watching the last season of The Apprentice there, so. Or at least the season finale. The season finale. Um, so look, so you said, we, you know, we took it pretty seriously, like, I mean, it's it defending democracy. Like, what else? Can, I mean, can you take anything more seriously? And that was the mentality across the team, that if we do anything meaningful in the entirety of our careers or our lifetimes, this is it. Mm -hmm. Like, this is the thing. And so we spent three and a half years working, threat modeling, trying to figure out every possible disruption that could be launched against the election. And, and it, it, we used a, a foreign threat actor, you know, typically considered Russia, but you know, they put the playbook out there in 2016. And so we knew that, that others would be picking it up and running with it, and, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's Iran or, or others. Um, but the funny thing is that as we got closer and closer to the election, as, and this was kind of over the summer, uh, we, we were thinking through you know what, it's not the technical attacks that are keeping us up at night because we think we've got a, a pretty resilient system with good indicators, good networks that we'd spot stuff coming and we'd see it on, maybe not on network, but we'd see it through the election process. But, but this stuff is still almost black boxy. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't take a whole lot for someone to come out of the woodwork and, you know, because look, disruptions happen every election day. I think back to, uh, the various, um, uh, the primaries, like I think Georgia and Virginia both had road work where back hose severed fiber that knocked off a precinct and like stuff like that, just like we've seen conspiracy theorists take and spin any other little minor story like that, you know, elections like in particular. Aren't real? Yeah. I mean, it just really, it, it kind of, it ramps up. So, so it came down to the perception hack that we were most worried about again, planning against a, a, a foreign adversary. But when it came down to it, in the middle of an election, when it's all domestic based, the, the oath that we pledged to uphold and defend the constitution is, is foreign or domestic. Mm -hmm. And so we were within our authorities. It was within you know, the, the oath and the pledge we'd made. And it was not terribly difficult to 
to, to call out nonsense where we saw it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, you know, targeting individuals and it wasn't targeting, you know, specific claims from individuals. It was seeing themes emerge mm -hmm. and watching the engagement, watching the activity and providing, not rebutting them on their face because that's just dumb. It helps amplify mm -hmm. the original claim, but it's putting authoritative information out there on no, a Sharpie does not bleed through a ballot and cause either a misvote or a vote for the opponent. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important about the stuff that we study when we talk about media manipulation, disinformation campaigns. Uh, you know, there is quite a bit of calling out nonsense, mm -hmm. but there's also a quite a bit of it that is either state-sponsored propaganda. When we look at these issues uh, across different nations, there's different things that get, ex different wedge issues that get exploited, whether mm -hmm. it's religion or race or gender, whatever is uh, of highest contestation and polarization in different countries, we will see different actors step into the fray, yep. whether it's government themselves or foreign adversaries or political pundits or just the entire grifter sphere. What do you think could or should be done about situations like that where um, social media does play some role because of the amplification effects, the, as we've talked about in the past, the velocity mm -hmm. here. But what else should we be thinking about? Uh, you know, feel free to bring up any of the s things that have come up in the Aspen Information right. Disorder Commission. You know, we've got a very young group of people here, many of which will go into uh, policy work, either um, public policy or public service, or will even some of them will go into some of these companies. Right. What do they need to be thinking about now? So I think you, you actually may have given up an easier case study of seeing a foreign adversary getting on a platform and amplifying or manipulated data. The way I have, have viewed for some time now disinformation, it, it's, it's a supply and demand problem. Mm -hmm. And on the supply side, you have a disruption factor that the intelligence community can, can provide by digging into their networks and their intelligence collection and understand, okay, so this country is trying to do this and they're targeting this issue and they're using these identities uh, and, and these persona. Mm -hmm. All right, let's roll that package up and then share it with uh, a platform that's being manipulated and, and let them conduct their operation okay. and if, their own investigation. And, and then, so those sorts of things. And I think, you know, this is where, you know, to their credit, a number of the platforms actually have done a, a, a pretty good job on the targeted campaigns by foreign actors. Mm -hmm. But it's also kind of low hanging fruit. And that's like a tiny little slice of the pizza. You know, well, is it? Do we know what? I mean, we don't have the data. Oh, uh, so perhaps there are some recommendations. Okay. Um, that where you know we, we hear a lot of talk about regulating the the platforms, and I don't, I honestly don't think we know enough about how the platforms operate right now to make meaningful regulation, meaningful legislation to then inform regulation. Okay. There's we have to have more required disclosures from the platforms. The thing that I kind of compare us to is, uh, on, this, I'm gonna date myself here, but it's actually not Did you have a live ago. journal? Is that what you're gonna tell no, us? No, no. So Forget. when I was on MySpace, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but back, no, back in, back in the early 2000s with, uh, with Enron, right? Mm -hmm. Enron was a significant fraud and accounting uh, scandal uh, because well, among other reasons, there, there, they, there was an appropriate transparency and disclosures on the part of the company that laid, laid, led to uh, you know, the collapse of this company that then also led to Sarbanes-Oxley, which is a required set of disclosures for publicly traded companies. So I think from a, from a, from a platform perspective, social media platform perspective, I liken us to a post-Enron moment where there that we haven't had the appropriate disclosures and transparency into the business operations, the financial models, the, the algorithms, the moderation, the targeting, the advertisements, the sponsored content, all these things. And so we need a Sarbanes-Oxley equivalent. 
not to regulate content, not to regulate speech, but to demand a set of disclosures and access by researchers into how these platforms conduct their operations. And that will do two things, I think. One is provide more insight into, for instance, what are the desired, you know, what does success look like for how a algorithm is optimized? You know, what are the sorts of uh, outcomes you're trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. And that, I think, would provide the market a little bit more understanding of how they're being gamed mm -hmm. and they can make a set of decisions. So recently, certain disclosures made by Reuters over how um, AT&T and DirecTV sponsored One American News, like that was like, oh, well, we always knew they were there. I personally don't like how they've amplified um, election disinformation. And so I had more information where I could go make uh, uh, an informed decision with my dollars. So I switched mm -hmm. off AT&T and I canceled DirecTV. Good. So that, you know, there is more information now transparency. Now you have more time for YouTube. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I may have signed you. up with YouTube yeah. Live TV. <laughs> um, but so, so one is like it gives the market more information, but the yeah. second is, is it gives policymakers uh, more information to make the appropriate policy interventions. Mm -hmm. And we don't, I don't think that we have enough information right now to make meaningful, targeted mm -hmm. policy interventions. Yeah, and this goes back to needing many, much more research on the harms caused by these platforms, including just, including just basic like financial fraud, personal injury, and then of course there are these collective social injuries like uh, January 6th. But we're about to go to audience Q&A, so I just want to alert you that people can line up keeping uh, a healthy distance between one another at microphone there and over there and then up there and over there. Um, and we will take questions oh, from wow. the crowd. But earlier I mentioned pizza. <laughs> do you like pineapple on your pizza? <sighs> I do not, no. Well, what's the deal? Why, so. why did CISA get involved in that war? Because <laughs> that, you know, that's, gonna, that's a big All right. one. So two th summer 2019, we launched a campaign call named the War on Pineapple. So the idea here was, remember that supply and demand problem of disinformation. So there, there are parts of the federal government that have the opportunity to engage on the supply side and disrupt supply. A civilian agency like CISA, which is a public-private partnership, an education, outreach, and engagement-oriented agency, has to focus on the demand side. And so what we were aspiring to do was help uh, increase awareness on how disinformation campaigns, influence operations work. And so we distilled it down. Again, this was in the, the wake of 2016 and some of the techniques that the Russians used to amplify kind of social discord. Uh, but we distilled it down to five uh, steps. The first is just identifying the issue. The second is seasoning and putting accounts into place to start amplifying the issue. Third is actually <laughs> amplifying it. Fourth is taking it mainstream. So that means getting it out of the, you know, the, the 4chan, 8con, whatever, and, and then even off of Facebook into the media where you actually want newsrooms talking about the thing you're stoking. And then lastly, you want to bring it into the real world. You want real live in meat space people yeah. protesting and counter protesting and, and they were the russians were able to uh get count protests and counter protest on race issues on gun guns rights issues and that you know so so we used we had to find an issue it can't be you know a political issue because you turn off 50 percent of the people in a in a bad way like lizard brain <laughs> shut off type um and, and then, you know, same thing with like, you can't talk about Russia because then it's like Russia, Russia, Russia. Uh, so the team, uh, the election integrity team, uh, the election security initiative team went out to lunch and they were debating like, okay, what are just like normal type things that are kind of binary where, you know, it's like you're, you're on one side or the other. Like and cilantro. Cilantro. Yeah. Or salt and vinegar chips mm -hmm. or black licorice. Yeah. Um, now, Twizzlers are awesome, but not black licorice. But no, it came like the most animated discussion at the lunch table was Hawaiian pizza, whether you like pineapple on your pizza or not. 
And it was like at that, like a star was born. Like in that, we launched this campaign. I was in New York, went to a pizza uh, joint and had you know, a slice of pepperoni and a slice of uh, Hawaiian. And we, we launched it. We were working with um, secretaries of state and election directors and had them pitted against each other. So it actually was honestly a coordinated and authentic behavior campaign so we probably should have been yes we probably should have been moderated no this, you just you labeled it you put your name on it Come it was on. it just, was uh, we can also have you know public public uh what are they called psa's public service announcements but it took off yeah. and like now yeah. anytime hawaiian pizza comes up on twitter i get tagged and it's just like <laughs> it never ends and you really don't like pineapple on your pizza it's just like, but like pineapple cheese and tomato sauce, like together? Oh, well, you haven't lived, apparently. <laughs> we have some open <laughs> microphones, so please, who's got courage tonight? One of you does. But we've done a couple other, while well, people... Move to the microphone. Get, we've done other sort of kind of innovative, different sort of um, activities and campaigns to generate awareness. We, there are a couple graphic novels. Uh, on disinformation. The first one was real fake, and the second one was bug bite, bug bites. Those are both available on CISA.gov. And then the third was a was a, uh, a game called Harmony Square, where you could actually play both sides. But you know, you could you know, the, the objective is to uh, actually cause you know, chaos in a community through disinfo. Amazing. Okay, we've got a few intrepid people. So name affiliation at the school here at Harvard and then how much I paid you to be here and, <laughs> and a question that ends in a question mark. Um, hi, um, my name is Andrew. I'm a student at uh, professors, uh, Professor Donovan's class. I'm a Master of Public Administration student here. Um, professor, this, you, you're hilarious. This is your best life. Yes. Um, you should do all of them. Uh, Chris, question. <laughs> um, so you, you talked about- How much did you pay him? Uh, well, I do get Jeez. them all pineapple pizza at the end of the <laughs> quarter, so. I was promised five. Um, <laughs> Chris, you spoke about disclosure, and I was wondering, uh, by the tech companies, um, and I was wondering what the state is, is for this. I would assume there is a lot of resistance because algorithms, stuff like this, is uh, pr uh, intellectual property. It's part of their DNA. They don't want to let it go. Um, what the status quo is for disclosure in, in terms of the state, and what kind of levers do you have for coercion? or persuasion. Thank you. It's gonna, I mean, I, I, I don't think self-regulation works. I, there have been plenty of opportunities for self-regulation to date, and there haven't been meaningful cost impositions to change behaviors, I don't think. Um, so it's gonna require legislative action, um, which, you know, if you're as jaded as I am, you, you think that that's really difficult in today's political climate in Congress. But if there's anything that both sides of the aisle hate right now, and it's, it's social media platforms, and they're willing you know, they, to, you know, they'll hold their nose and take lobbying, you know, take political contributions. But I think that this is an area that, that you can probably find some middle ground. It won't be a dramatic p legislative package, but there'll be some kind of bare minimums. And some of the proposals I've seen, you know, bare minimum access to um, certain, you know, whether it's content moderation uh, libraries, you know, the, again, the, the kind of the parameters for uh, algorithmic optimization, you know, opening, up, opening that up to a limited set of security researchers and journalists um, to, to review. I mean, again, on their own, they're not gonna do it. So. Uh, that's that's just but that's just table stakes for me mm -hmm. um, there's got to be I think a lot more I, so I think something will get done it, it'll disappoint everybody but it'll move continue to move the ball forward and I don't think we should discount the possibility of culture shift right it's not that you had to legislate Friendster and MySpace to go away sometimes something else just comes along so that's a so like that's Betamax right the VHS like technology always has these moments of replacement this so the Betamax VCR thing that's an entirely different JFK Jr. form um, and, and why <laughs> VCR which is the inferior yeah, technology yeah, yeah, um, yeah. prevailed uh, so, I had both. I had a VHS <laughs> and a VHS. Um, 
so we have to, you know, to your bigger point, like the, the social media platforms we have today may not, may not and will not be the social media platforms we have tomorrow. And so I think to the market driving, I, I mean, I do think there is an opportunity for differentiation um, in that somebody actually making a uh, socially responsible platform going forward. Now, at the same time, we're going to see even crazier balkanization and fragmentation of the social media market. Well, you'll get, you'll just see crazy stuff over here. But, you know, one thing that I think is also open for government intervention is it's, I think it's about time for a digital services agency or a digital agency. Mm -hmm. They can think about privacy, focus on privacy. They can focus on trust and safety programs because mm -hmm. we still see a very, you know, inconsistent landscape for trust and safety measures and platforms. Um, this is where we get into like, won't anybody think of the children um, angle? Won't they though? All right. I mean, come on. We and just then, gotta have apps that children can't use. Don't you think? <laughs> like resorts that children can't go to so you can have a nice vacation. <laughs> Spoken like a lesbian, I know, I know. But I, I do agree with you. So there, but there's, again, these, there are a lot of table stakes out there. I just think that from a bureaucratic perspective, we still, it, there, there's a lot of internal resistance and a lot of kind of money on the sidelines that are gonna mm -hmm. keep things in check. Or keep things in place. We'll go here and then we'll go over here. Hi, thank you so much for coming to speak with us. Um, my name's Rachel. I'm a junior at the college. I study folklore mythology. And my question is, um, you've worked on top-down efforts to monitor and combat misinformation. How effective do you think bottom-up activist community organizing efforts are, and how, what would that ideally look like? So, mm, one of the problems right now with um, particularly the way the, some of the 2020 election oh gosh here's mm. the chance yeah mm. um one of the problems with the the 2020 election disinformation is that where it was initially top down it actually and kate starboard mm -hmm. talks about this out at UW, but in others but participatory disinformation where you actually see this rotation back and forth mm. and i think what's happened is that it's metastasized to a level that there's no longer control. It's actually, mm -hmm. it's, it's gone, I think to really kind of to your point, it's gone almost to an AstroTurf operation where things are starting and you've lost the ability to control what you thought was a campaign that was gonna mm -hmm. serve your own, own benefits. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, and unfortunately that's, that is my biggest concern about the run up to 2022 and mm -hmm. 2024 beyond that, is that we've lost the narrative yeah. and, and that has always been the point by the way that is always that was always the point of the russians in 2016. that was always the point in 2020. it was to have the rational thinkers lose the ability to understand what was what the truth was what the facts were to doubt the system and cause chaos mm -hmm. and therefore you don't know what's true anymore yeah and and so that's that's where we are and uh, you know when you have you know, virtually an entire political party embracing mm. that trend, as I've said on Face the Nation, so I'll say it again here, it's, it's an anti-democratic death spiral. Just... Yeah, and to that cutesy metaphor um, of the anti-democratic death spiral, you know, the, the way in which grassroots organizations are shoring up their defenses, Jonathan Corpus Ong is here somewhere. Where's... Where is he? He's over here. So he's been researching this in the context of the Philippines where, uh, it, you know, civil society organizations actually have to dedicate a good share of their communication resources mm. to fighting it out on social media and to, to, and to calling out these campaigns and saying these horrible things are happening. Within the U.S., there's a, a coalition of about 200 organizations called the Disinformation Defense League that pool ideas and resources and sometimes work together on social media campaigns. But it's really just, um, you know, the slingshot versus Goliath at this point, right? Because of yeah. the resources, as you're saying, that the go into the coordinated campaigns where political pundits or politicians are willing to burn their accounts as well, uh, especially if it right. means gaining uh, notoriety on particular issues. It's good and, for fundraising. 
It is it's incredible good for, for fundraising. And just to think that all these school board protests are organic, like that's the point of astroturfing. No, these are being yeah. coordinated and sponsored. Incredible. Over here. Great question. Thank you. Um, how's it going, everyone? I'm Derek. I'm an MPP2 here at HKS. Uh, so I have a question kind of about your point um, about how little we know about digital platforms. Uh, I think I agree that you know, it's difficult to make meaningful um, and good legislation or regulation around them without knowing more. Uh, but to the point about um, sort of pushing for transparency and then using um, knowledge and information that's produced based on their disclosures to make laws at some point in the future, like producing knowledge can take a long time. It would take you know years for studies to be done for a sufficient body of knowledge to be built to make informed decisions. And then when that happens, there would be a lengthy public debate process. And yep. in between now and then, there would be elections and coups and genocides, um, all things that will be like facilitated or impacted by disinformation. So like in the immediate term, what do you think uh, sort of we as policymakers, as citizens, um, as a society can do to sort of uh, guard against disinformation? I I mean, this is, this is the question, right? There's no silver bullet. There's no single solution. We have, uh, you know, we still have freedom of speech issues and the government, you know, the last possible thing I would want is the government start wading into the middle of content moderation decisions and start declaring things off, you know, uh, out of bounds or off limits. And we really struggle with that, I think, in both the research community as well as, you know, in the policymaker side. And that's what's held back. That's what, like, when it's the Russians interfering with elections, oh, that stuff's easy. Oh, you can deal with that. Uh, but when it comes back home, and, and particularly when you talk about a lot of the domestic extremism issues, uh, but look, free speech is not absolute. There are, you know, there are carve-outs for defamation. There, you know, there's also criminal issues here. So uh, I, I think given what's in front of us, particularly with the Facebook whistleblower disclosures, mm -hmm. we have an incredible resource that I think one of the first imperatives is sorting through that, find out what we have, and that can help jumpstart some of the, you know, as we wait a year and a half for legislation and then regulations after that. Use what's in front of us to help jumpstart and maybe see around corners a little bit faster. We can hope so, and you know, I think that there's you know, quite a bit of journalists and other folks working on this right now who are trying to get to the the nut of yeah. what Facebook knew and when they knew it, especially around violent and inciting right. content. And so, look, and so one more piece, just because that's like a completely unsatisfying answer, and I get that. Because, uh, you know, what I am fearful of, having been in government now a couple times, and seeing how they, you know, the government's both ineffective and bureaucratic and actually oftentimes makes the wrong decisions. The, the other thing I didn't really emphasize here is, is you can't, like, don't, for the love of God, do not rely on the government to fix everything. There are still things, there are, there, is, there are table stakes that we can do. So professional organizations, medical boards, uh, state bar associations have to self-police. They have to take care of themselves and their own members uh, and, and call out and kick out people that are abusing the, the, you know, the trust and abusing the privileges that come with membership. We saw that in Oregon recently where uh, there was some, some COVID-related disinfo. Um, and then you know, we, we continue to see a series of bar disciplinary actions across mm -hmm. the country because of election disinfo claims. Amazing. Over here. I am a senior research internet policy fellow at Jones uh, with Jones team um, at the Shorenstein Center. My name's April. So there is a real urgency to do something now and a lot of verve and a lot of different directions to get something done. But what are the dangers of doing something wrong now or getting the policy incorrect and possibly codifying something that will be really hard to undo? And I ask that in light of the fact that I see platforms saying they want to be regulated, right? Which is always kind of a red flag because the things that they're calling for wouldn't necessarily <laughs> curtail their power. And so I'm curious, like, you know, the midterms are basically tomorrow. <laughs> People want to do something now, makes sense. What are the dangers of, of getting it wrong? So I think without developing, you know, having an open policy discussion and debate, you know, you run into 
a situation where it, with significant unintended consequences that have civil liberties and free speech impacts. Um, that is a number of the recommendations I've seen, you know, we start losing um, some of those freedom of speech protections. And, and that, you know, I think in the meantime, there are things we can do in terms of limitations, like Section 230, for instance. You know, it's not like throw Section 230 out, which gives immunity to uh, anyone for, for, through the platforms for, for content moderation purposes, but there should be caveats. There, there, should be, there can be carve outs, particularly when you talk about financial in advertisements, and once there's a profit motive associated with, um, you know, and, and the FTC, for instance, has authorities right now for fraud and fraud enforcement. So you think about uh, Dr. Mercola and some of the others that the, mm -hmm. the, the pandemic profiteers, we need to resource those that already have the authorities, give them the capabilities to actually more meaningfully uh, enforce against it. That's, that's where we start. And yeah, enforcing even the uh, what they have already on the books in terms of terms of service. What was horrible about some of these disclosures is you figure out that there's millions of people that have very high influencer counts um, on white lists that basically don't even hold them to account for the um, terms of service, right? Which then provide cover. So that's where it should be the other way around. Yeah, right? if you have when more you have followers, that you should have more responsibility, right? Yes. Yep. More amplification, more, more responsibility. You know. Instead, engagement drives the business model and drives yeah. more clicks, and yeah. that's ad revenue. Yeah, and you know, and Section Two Thirty, I've always viewed as a a policy of decontrol. That is, it was put in place at a time when you didn't have instantaneous high fidelity broadcast and download. Now each and every one of us is like a television station, you know, with our telephones. And the it's, advertising model wasn't created yet. And the advertising model wasn't baked in directly, yeah. which allowed you to, right. to monetize everything so instantaneously. And I think it would be a good bet to push uh, for regulation that would at least uh, regulate political ads in such a way so that there was more transparency and we knew how much was being spent and do mandatory reporting rather than these volunteer, you know, transparency databases. But, I don't disagree with you. It's never going to happen. Yeah, you don't disagree with No, me because the say. ones that you're actually going to impact through that regulation are the political... The, the people that you're that asking making. to govern themselves. Right, and that just doesn't work that way. That is, right. that's true. Well, unfortunately, we have reached the end of our sparring session. <laughs> so I think we get to bare knuckle box in the alley. Oh, is that right? This. Yes, I think so. Are you up for it? Sure. We didn't disagree really on anything. It was a great conversation, oh, no. Chris. It was fun. It was really nice to talk to you. Thanks for having and, me. Uh, I'll remember next time not to put pineapple on your pizza. <laughs> and please, Thanks. and thank you for what you were willing to do. Uh, it took a lot of courage to stand up in that moment and to fight for your team and to fight for the work uh, that everybody had put into that election. And we are very thankful and grateful uh, f to you for being willing to, to really take that hit. So thank you so much. Thank you.